Thank you for that prayer, Rick, reminding us that it is our job to take care of others, which is kind of what I'm going to be preaching on this morning. Um, as many of you know, we are in the midst of a worship series called Seasons of Creation. During this May, we as a church have been thinking about creation, thinking about nature, thinking about our relationship to nature, thinking about our relationship to creation, trying to find our proper place in all of that. Also thinking about what creation can teach us about life and faith and, and what um, parts of it can motivate us into action. Uh, throughout this worship series, we have been reading from the Psalms. So uh, for the last four weeks, uh, the scripture has been a psalm. And then uh, next week in our final uh, final worship for this series, we also will be reading from a psalm. Um, as you know, uh, psalms are the closest thing that we would have is like poetry or song lyrics. That would be the closest genre that we have nowadays that would be like a psalm. So they're, they're kind of pieces of art uh, that are put out there by beautiful artists in terms of um, ways that they can praise God, uh, talk about the hardships of their life, talk about the joys of their life. So it just comes out with quite a bit of emotion because these are little pieces of art, artistic pieces. Um, and it's appropriate that during this worship series, we're taking on the Psalms because many of the Psalms talk about nature, talk about creation and lift up kind of the power of creation um, and, and raise it up and praise nature. So we are going to be reading from Psalm 19, the very beginning of it, in just a little bit here. And um, we're going to be reading from the message version, so it's going to sound a little different than the traditional NRSV, NIV, uh, even CEB versions of the psalm. But if we read kind of the traditional version of this psalm, you might recognize it because, I don't know, there were some guys, their names were Bach and Beethoven and Handel, and they took the lyrics of this psalm and they put it to music. So for those of you who um, appreciate classical music, uh, you might recognize this psalm from some of the work of our greatest composers. And at the very beginning of this psalm, um, the psalmist talks about nature, and it talks about how nature can be our teacher can be our teacher. So thinking about teaching and learning, uh, after we read the little bit of this psalm, I'm actually going to give you a quiz on a couple questions about the psalm. So I'm going to give you the questions ahead of time. So as you are reading the psalm, you can be prepared and be looking for the answers. So here's the two questions that you're going to be asked after we read this together. The first question is, who are the teachers? Actually, this version of it, this paraphrase of this psalm, talks about a couple names of teachers. And then the second question that I'm going to ask is, how are they teaching us? What strategy are these teachers using to actually teach us something? Um, I think psalms are read best together, so I'd invite you to join your voice with my voice for the beginning of Psalm 19. God's glory is on tour in the skies. God craft on exhibit across the horizon. Madame Day holds classes every morning. Professor Knight lectures each evening. Their words aren't heard. Their voices aren't recorded. But their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. Okay, class, are you ready for your quiz? So, who are the teachers? Madam Day and Professor Knight, very good. Okay, and how are they teaching us? What strategy are they using to teach us? Silence. You got it. Silence. That's how we are being taught. So, I come from a teaching family. I don't know what it is about teachers, but they tend to have children who grow up to be teachers, and that would be me. Uh, my grandpa Surato was a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse. Is there anybody in here that went to a one-room schoolhouse by any chance? There are. There are a couple of people that have just a single teacher, right, in a one-room classroom. Okay, so my grandpa was a one-room schoolhouse teacher. My um, dad was a teacher. My uncle was a teacher. My dad was a teacher. Um, I married a teacher. My husband's mom is a teacher, and he's got uh, a couple siblings that are teachers. So, you know, we're just all teachers together. So it's no surprise that 
Uh, my first career was in uh, education. Many of you know that I was a school psychologist and school counseling, then moved on uh, and taught at UW-Stout. I continue to teach at UW-Stout in their school of education. I thought I should put a picture of myself teaching up on the screen, and boy, it's kind of funny. Teachers don't have many pictures of them teaching because, you know, you're not behind the camera, right? Well, at some point, um, a student must have snapped a picture of me and sent it because, sure enough, on my phone, here's a picture of me teaching at Stout. <coughs> And one thing that I have noticed as I've studied good teaching and learning over the years is that good teachers have good command and authority in their classrooms. Now, I don't mean that in like a demanding, mean way, you know, like, oh, they've got the power and they're lording it over their students. That's not how I mean it. What I mean is that they've got good plans They've got good strategies, they're in control of their content and their materials, that they've worked really hard to build strong relationships with their students so that they can move their students from point A to point B. My husband, like I mentioned, he is a teacher, and when he talks about how it feels to teach, this is what he says. He says, I feel like I'm a mountain guide. That these, I, I stand at this post and another mountain guide brings me these students. They, they, they've made their way from post, this post to the next post and now they're mine. And I am now their guide and I take them up the mountain from this post to the next post. And while I'm with them, I'm pointing out things in the environment. I'm asking them to look at their context, what's around them. I'm asking them to make connections. I'm asking them to reflect on what they're seeing and the materials that are all around them. And then they get to the post. They get handed off to another guide that takes them further up the mountain. Now, the word dominion is kind of a tricky word because there's a lot of, like, meaning in that word, like powerful meaning in that word. So I don't know as if it fully describes what it's like for a teacher in a classroom, for a teacher to have dominion of a classroom. But in some ways, there are some aspects of teaching where, where a teacher is, is the, the classroom is the teacher's domain. The teacher has dominion over the classroom. And we do live in God's dominion, God's classroom. That is where we live. We live in a creation that is well-ordered, and well planned. There is uh, patterns and there is structure to nature. In fact, the rain today is part of this pattern, isn't it? The spring pattern that we get into, you know, where heat builds up and then there's precipitation and this is a spring pattern that we feel that's part of our environment, part of the order of things. And there are plenty of visual aids that God has given us in this classroom there is plants, and there's water, and there's rocks, and there is soil, and there's animals, there's mountains, and there's clouds. All of it are our visual aids to learn from. And the scripture says that nature teaches us through silence, that that is where we learn the truth. Now, I don't know about this pedagogical strategy called science. Hmm. As a teacher, I can tell you I don't use that strategy very often in my classroom. We have moments where we reflect and there might be a little time to think and maybe write individually, but for the most part, there's a whole lot of talking going on. I'm talking, they're talking, right? There's a lot of words being used. But in nature, the strategy is silence. The psalmist tells us that nature, as our teacher, Madame Day and Professor Knight, they teach unspoken truth. Silence fills the earth, but unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. Truth. Pastor Dan and I had a training uh, this week over in the west side of the Twin Cities, so we drove together 
And we were having a conversation about how um, some of the teenagers in the church have kind of liked this sermon series. Um, after the uh, after worship, they'll come up and they'll talk about the series and they'll ask questions or they'll say things. A couple weeks ago, I had a student come up and tell me that I totally had the thing about where oxygen comes from and our environment wrong. You know, I talked about the rainforest and we need the trees because the oxygen. Okay, this person is here and smiling right now. And uh, the oxygen. And they were like, you know, actually, it comes from plankton, and they went on to explain how plankton works and all of that. So I asked, it, I asked him if he wanted to preach at 1030. He said no. So then I thought I should try to get it right. So I was trying to explain it back, like my understanding of it back, so I could say it to, 10, to the people at 1030 right. And um, uh, I couldn't get it right. He, he, he said, just say it like you said it. Just go ahead and say it like you said it at 9 o'clock. You're not going to get it. But it is interesting to think about, like, for teenagers, like, they're absorbed in science and social sciences in school. Like, their minds are absorbing all this. So when they hear this in the church environment, it kind of, like, piques their interest. Like, oh, things start to make sense to them. They start to make connections. It's relevant to what they're learning about in their lives. So Dan and I were kind of talking about this, you know, this relevancy for teenagers and these connections and, and reflecting on the fact that sometimes teenagers will think of pastors, oh, well, they just deal with the religious world. They don't get the rest of it always. But how we need to be teaching our students that truth is truth. All truth comes from God. Theological truth is truth. So it comes from God. Social studies truth is truth, so it comes from God. Science truth is truth, so it comes from God. Truth is truth, and all truth is from God. And sometimes Christians will do this thing that's actually harmful, where they'll actually put religion against science and say they're incompatible, they don't work together and I'm like, it's not a competition for who has the handle on truth. As, Dad said, as Dan said, truth is truth. All of it is from God. They don't have to be contradictory. In fact, science truth and religion truth can actually be complementary. One can inform the other, and the other can inform back. Truth is truth. And we have this incredible teacher of truth called nature. Do we see ourselves in God's classroom, in God's dominion? Is that how we see ourselves in relationship to creation and to nature? Or do we see creation and nature as something else? Because there's another Christian narrative out there that tells us that the earth has been given to human beings as a commodity. The earth and nature and creation has been given to us as a commodity, the resources just to use up at our will. They're just for us. There's a danger to that because then we place ourselves above creation. We don't have the proper relationship with it. And two weeks ago, that's what I spoke about, the danger in that. Creation is bigger and stronger than any single species that is part of it. And humans have the potential to make the earth inhabitable for themselves. And if we do that, the earth is going to shake us off and go on, heal itself, adapt, and evolve for other plant and animal species. We have to understand our proper place within this. Creation is God's dominion, not ours. And when we see it as our dominion, that's the very thing that leads to exploitation. Stripping of the earth through mining for metals that end up in our electronics. Fracking, the drilling of the holes through our earth. We literally are on this boat called the earth floating through the galaxy and we're drilling holes through our boat. Filling the air with gases that will wreck our atmosphere and make it impossible for us to live here. We are exploiting the earth and there is a human cost to it. And we think, oh, this human cost is so far away, it's so far out there, we'll never see it. 
But there's even a human cost now. Because exploitation of the environment and exploitation of people go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. Because those mines that have the cobalt in them that they're stripping have major child labor issues in them. We need the cheap metal. How do we get the cheap metal? We exploit countries and people and children to get it into our electronics. That fracking, we insist on putting pipelines through land that is connected to Native American land. Exploitation of the earth, exploitation of people are tied together. As the climate warms, guess what people have to do? Move to other areas where they can live because their area is no longer inhabitable. As people start to move around because of climate change, what we know by looking through history is that there is an increase of human conflict as people no longer have homes and are displaced. Earth exploitation, human exploitation go hand in hand. Now, I don't know about you, but when I find myself in this space, I'm like, this problem is so big. What can we even do about it? It feels so huge. Like, how can, I, how can we as individuals uh, with faith act when it just is so gigantic? So we do the things we put LED lights in. Right? We make our homes more efficient. We, we plant pollinator plants. We recycle. We do all those things, and those are all really important. And when we do them together, they do make a big dent in it. And there is a reality that it needs to be bigger scale than the individual work, that we need full industries and we need full policy to actually make these shifts in order to make this better on a large scale level. So one of the full scale industries that is working on this is the fair trade industry. Anybody ever heard of the fair trade industry? Yes, we know of that around here, right? Because we have a fair trade ministry in our church. Well, let me tell you about the fair trade industry. There's a bunch of statistics up there. It is an industry that works for both people and the planet. There are standards around child labor, sustainability, and living wages. In order for it to be stamped fair trade, they have to meet these standards. And business models are usually based on let's get the most out of of people as we we can absolutely get. So the, the farmers, the people that work the ground, are actually paid very little. But fair trade has a different model where it tries to get the dollars into the hands of the farmers that actually work the ground and not the middle people in between. That's, and, and they do it in a sustainable way. That's the business model. So like I said, we partner with a fair trade um, organization called Equal Exchange, and it's coffee and chocolate and nuts and tea Okay, because these are industries that have historically been dirty industries where there's been abuse of the land and child labor in them. So we sell it here at church third Sunday of the month, not for the church to make any kind of big profit. Trust me, the church is making uh, not a large profit off of this. We sell it because it is an opportunity for you all to be part of this industry to actually make a difference in the world. And this is a convenience for all of you. Um, I care deeply about the cocoa industry, particularly around Halloween. I always kind of get frustrated with the cocoa industry, knowing that there has been huge human abuses in uh, child labor in that industry. So here's a video about that from Equal Exchange, our fair trade supplier. Maybe. Do you want to click on that little triangle there, Paul, at the bottom?
one example of fair trade industry that's, that's made a difference. <clears throat> So I want to relate this back to our faith to end here. We uh, need to figure out how our faith can inform us in this. And the more that I think about this, the more that I realize that this is really about the mindset that we have around this and how we view our relationship with the earth. With the earth. When we see ourselves in competition with others, like if that's our mindset, this is going to be a get-what-you-can-get type of world. When we see ourselves as consumers, we're just going to eat up the resources of the world. We consume there. We consume them without thinking about the consequences. When we see the earth as our domain, we act as if we are in charge and we have the upper hand on it. But I'm going to suggest that our psalmist today actually gives us a different framework, a different way to relate to the earth that can help us with this as faithful people. We can recognize that this is God's domain, not our domain. God is the one in charge, and we are learners. That's our relationship with the earth. We are the learners. The earth is our teacher, Madame Day and Professor Knight. We should observe. We should reflect. We should pay attention to what they are teaching us about truth. It is not to be used up, the earth, but the earth provides us with the study tools because when we know better, we can do better. Amen.